How's everyone doing? I get, what is it, Thursday? So, one more day. Um, I've been giving this in a year, and it's probably, it's not too rusty, but if I talk fast, just, you can throw a hand up and say you're speaking too much New York. Um, I'm from New York, it will come out. Uh, yeah, um, anyway, okay, terrible joke. So, uh, well, today we're gonna talk about, this is like a TED Talk. The stories from the Stone Age, the domestication of the dog. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, we're all here today because of anthropology, and like um, we said, that I'm an anthropologist, and an anthropologist studies the human species, and that is human species in the past, human species in the present, and human species in the future. And we divide that, at least in America, into four different subfields. And if you guys want to give a whoop whoop, if I call it, run out. <laughs> Cultural, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> linguistic, there we go, okay. Uh, physical anthropology. All right, and then <laughs> archaeological anthropology, which is what I said. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is Cueva de los Manos in uh, Patagonia, and one of the most human things in the world is to make art, um, also having a dog. Um, and this is like a common symbol throughout the entire world, spraying ochre on the wall. And it, it says that people had the forethought to put their hand on the wall and spray that ochre and say, like, I was here. And it's a pretty human thing, and we have this in Asia, we have it in South America, we have it all over the world, and I think it's, it's really cool. Um, so I always put that up as an anthropology thing. Um, I was going somewhere with that. Um, anyway. Okay, <laughs> so um, I work for the Veterans Curation Program, um, as does Charles. Uh, he was here with my assistant today. Um, so what the Veterans Curation Program does is hire recently separated veterans um, to help curate archaeological collections owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. So essentially an archaeology lab, and we have veterans come in and help us um, take photography, they um, uh, let's say curate artifacts, we do uh, just some data entry, and while they do that, they get paid time to go look for jobs, build their resume, um, and all sorts of things. And they also get paid really well. Um, and then also we have career building and professional workshops that come in and help. Um, like we had their, uh, their service dogs come in the other day, we had uh, Team Rubicon comes in, and uh, people that help build resumes, and things like that. So if anyone's a veteran or knows a veteran that's looking for a job um, and then wants a fun, laid-back environment and wants me as a boss, um, I mean, send, me, or send them there. Um, I'm gonna grab some water first. But, so all dogs living today, no matter what size, what color, anything like that, are a genetic descendant of the gray wolf. And the gray wolf is known as Canis lupus in Latin. And the domestic dog a lot of people will say it's Canis familiaris. I subscribe to this one, Canis lupus familiaris. So it's the familiar wolf in Latin. Uh, it might seem hard to believe, this is my dog, this one here, um, that, um, oh yeah, this might seem hard to believe, but all dogs, no matter what size, like I said, Mastiff, Chihuahua, Pomeranian, are once wolves, and they're still a subspecies of the wolf. So how did this come about? I'm gonna put this into ecological context, put the domestication theories in order and explain what those are, and then the human and dog story. Um, I'm a processualist, if anyone knows what that is, um, but I do a lot of post-processual narrative things. So anyway, that's archaeology stuff. So the question today is this. Um, I love this meme. Um, so hopefully I can answer that. So, gray wolves evolutionary history. Canids first appear in the Eocene in North America. So North America wasn't exactly where it is now, but it was there. Um, and Eocene is here. We don't arrive until the Pleistocene, which is way up here. So we're a very young species, and I'm sure you guys know that. Like, not here for long at all. Um, Canids mostly evolved in the North American plains. But they later migrated, along with camels and horses, over to Eurasia. Um, and my favorite thing about that is one day, a camel came down from the mountains and was like, yo, where did everyone go? And they were like, well, they went over to Asia got two humps, some of them had one hump, and that person that was like, where's our milk, is what a llama is. They hide it in the mountains. <laughs> they're high altitude specialized, and all the other animals migrated back to Eurasia, or not back to Eurasia for the first time. But we consider camels and horses a very European or Asian species, but actually they're evolved, not for deserts, but they're evolved for uh, living in the Ice Age tundra of North America. Um, so, tangent, I'll do a lot of those. Uh, gray wolves, red wolves, and dogs are all part of the 38 subspecies of uh, modern wolves today. And then wolves are the largest of the living canids. And the dire wolf, not just a Game of Thrones invention, was a real wolf that lived in North America and it is now extinct, went extinct around 10,000 years ago. 
Um, so modern wolves have an average weight of 60 to 175 pounds. Has anyone seen like a real wolf? Have you seen one in the wild? Yeah, they're, they're pretty big when you see them. Um, yeah, exactly. And then uh, they're distinct from other canids by their cranial, dental, and behavioral traits. So, um, oh yeah, so I was gonna do this real quick. So imagine you have nothing else other than stone, wood, and bone to defend yourself. And it is like really cold. I'm gonna say like Game of Thrones cold. Um, like you don't know what inside is besides a cave or a mammoth hut. And then you're going to hunt and it's getting dark and you're like, man, I need to get back home tonight. And then you hear, and it should be louder and scarier. But anyway, if you live in a world where there's no guns, there's no animal control, that is pretty terrifying. And you want to get home as quick as you can. Um, so to put that into context, and there's also snarling, I'm not going to go into that. But, um, just think about it being scary. So these animals weren't necessarily our friends at first. Um, you probably know they live in complex social groups called packs. Oh, here's the dog. Um, packs usually consist of two to four families of wolves um, in an environmental, or, or, sorry, one male, one female, and their various offspring. And wolves are monog monogamous, uh, which is a really uncommon thing in the animal kingdom. And not monogamous and they mate for life, but monogamous in the sense that they, I guess, they mate for life, but they, if, uh, if one of them dies, they'll get another mate sometimes, but they don't really, they're not promiscuous in their packs. Um, the average pack size usually consists of about five to 10 wolves, but during severe environmental pressure, it can go up to 40. And that was documented in, um, I think, Siberia from one study. Um, alpha males only frequently appear in captivity. That's not really a wild wolf thing, at least in the theories that I've read. But outcasts, for sure, are a natural phenomenon, however. So there's not necessarily an alpha, whereas wolves are constantly fighting for dominance. There's not one that like says, you guys can't eat, or you guys can't do this and that. It, it changes. But there's definitely outcasts, and I want you guys to remember the complex social group thing I talked about, and then this outcast phenomenon. Um, so, like I said, they're a top predator. They're ruthlessly efficient pack hunters, just like humans. So it can be argued that bears and felines sit at the top of the food chain, but next to us, it's definitely the wolf. Um, however, bears are solitary foragers, cats hunt at night by themselves, and cats usually have, oh, I just said that. Um, <laughs> what makes the wolf so deadly, though, in addition to its intelligence, is its um, teeth, strength, and stamina. So a wolf can chase down an animal as a pack, and they do this coordinatedly and they're social and they do this in a very like it's a science and they keep chasing until the animal becomes exhausted and that's called persistence hunting humans do the same thing and one of the theories as to why we're hairless mammals is because we sweat and we don't have to stop to pant when we're hunting something but you don't have to hunch over and do that all of your excess heat escapes your body through sweat and the only hair on our heads is to protect us from the sun um and we also you know, other hair, but um, um, that denotes that you're of that age. But anyway, uh, we do the same thing, and that's why wolves have historically been a symbol of fear. It's something that can chase us, and they're, it were an enemy at one point, and that's why they're almost hunted to extinction. Um, they're a nuisance, and they're scary. Um, this is why we sweat. So this is from, I think, a documentary um, on National Geographic, but yeah, it's, it's pretty terrifying. Like, a cat does it at night, um, but wolves can do it in a pack in broad daylight. Not many other animals do that. Um, so canids have a long, strong snout filled with thousands of scent receptors, and that's one of their main adaptations, is their ability to smell. And they can smell up to a mile away. Some dogs can only smell up to about three quarters of a mile. Um, receptors, uh, they're, uh, they're deadly teeth, sorry. And then their huge canines easily sink into muscle and veins. Um, what wolves do is they grab an animal by the leg and shake it down, and then they do that worries a cat, which I'll get to, does something different. Um, and they can exert up to 1,500 pounds of pressure per square inch in one bite. So you definitely don't want to mess with that. Um, and then the oral osteology wolves, so like I said, can grab their prey, they can crush their leg bones and drag them down. Uh, they have, let's see, their premolars and molars are called carnassials, which are these teeth right here. Um, they're essentially like a shearing and grinding um, device and this is used for crushing bone, and that's why your dog chews bones in the back of his mouth, like way in the back. They're using it to crush the bone to get the marrow-rich nutrients out. And that makes this 
seriously more morbid. But <laughs> for you cat people, felines are evolved to silently stalk, lunge, and pounce. And uh, move, or move, I should say. Cats are an enigma. They also have scissor-like carnassials, and this allows for one quick bite to the throat or spine. They don't come up in a pack and rip something apart. They just one-shot kill it if they can, or they grab it with their claws. Anyone have a cat that brings in dead things? Yeah. Okay. My cat, Jon Snow, he had a kill. <laughs> 300. I like Game of Thrones. But, <laughs> um, so this is a cat, a domestic cat, and it's a debate as to if we domesticated them to keep them um, domesticated them at all. Some people think they're still a wild species that just happen to live with us. Um, and I don't know where I stand in that debate, because there's compelling evidence for both. Um, but after the invention of agriculture, and we stop hunting and gathering, and we sit down in uh, you know, sedentary environments, we're building houses, we're farming, we have a lot of rats. And cats, um, Felis sylvestris lydica, and Felis sylvestris africanus, were the wild species of cats that lived around the Middle East when we started to do this. They noticed we had all these rats in our granaries, cats started coming up. So it might not be that we specifically were like, hey cats, come on in. They just kind of made themselves at home and literally haven't left. Um, <laughs> so the wild cat, Felis sylvestris, looks just like a regular house cat. So this is one of the arguments that they're not domesticated. So when you put them together, you really can't tell the difference. They're a little bigger, and depending on the cat, like there's a Maine Coon, Jon Snow is a Norwegian forest cat. Um, he's huge. Uh, he, um, you can't really tell the difference. And if you were to kick a dog out, say a chihuahua, it would probably die within a week or two because it can't hunt unless it doesn't have food. If you leave your cat home alone for three weeks, it will probably run your house. They can <laughs> They just survive. And if you were to go, evolution really hooked cats up. Because if you were to go to another planet, you would definitely see some kind of, and they had alien life, some kind of cat or dog-like creature because they're just perfect hunters. So they have claws that can retract, they have night vision, and then they can also hear really far away, they have whiskers, and they always end up on their feet. So they're a pretty cool predator. But back to dogs. Um, <laughs> notice the differences between this. So dogs, like I said, are like have a, a gripping like scenario in their mouth, whereas a cat is just a clear, concise, just chop when they get through something and they kill it. And I can't remember the name of the common ancestor that wolves and cats have, but they're very similar. And then we have dog-like carnivores, which are bears, uh, seals, and then we have cat-like carnivores, which are hyenas, um, and uh, otters, and what's the other one? Or no, sorry, weasels. All those things kind of diverge into felidae, and, or not felidae, but they're in, not their own clad, but they're very similar. Anyway, tangent. it. Um, note these wolf traits in your dogs. Wolves are vicious hunters, and some might say killing machines. This is why dogs like to rip things apart. When you come home to this, it's not your dog being disobedient, and it, technically it is, but it's in their DNA coding to rip things up. That's why when they grab a toy, you don't have to teach them to. They just know to shake it around in their head or in their mouth. Um, they need to do it. It's in their DNA. So don't blame your puppy. Blame evolution. Mm -hmm. Fresh puppy is nature's killing machine. That came from an article, but. Um, Wolf hunting and social behaviors are exaggerated through breeding to create different dogs. So Salukis for running, that's one of the oldest breeds actually. Border Collies for hunting and stalking. Huskies for their wolf-like appearance and strength. And then German Shepherd Dogs for their obedience and intelligence and wolf-like appearance. So note that the wolf here, and see how it runs. Now take the fastest wolf you've ever seen and breed it and breed it and breed it with the next fastest one. And eventually you get the Saluki and the Greyhound, which has a chest cavity that's twice the size of most wolves, uh, you know, per ratios. And they have to do that because they have an extreme like pulmonary system to pump all that oxygen through their body to run fast. And um, all dogs do different things. So you can take any dog and move it down to something. So a dachshund is meant to get badgers out of burrows so they make it elongated. It's literally crazy how special and like dogs are a human tool at least to me and humans make tools that's part of anthropology and we design these things through evolution and or breeding to do different things for us so note the wolf hair stalking and a border collie if that border collie had wolf colored hair you wouldn't know the difference um, they also stalk sheep or because of the way wolves this is in yellowstone have that predators or prey respond to wolves in this context, you know, so when sheep see a dog, they really don't know the difference between a dog and a wolf, it's just they know to hide from it. People picked up on that, 
and bred and bred and bred shepherd dogs until they did this. And Border Collies and German Shepherds are some of the most intelligent breeds. And I think there's a Border Collie out there that knows like 300 something English words. Like they can say pick up Pikachu or pick up um, Hey Arnold, like a stuffed animal toy, and they'll pick it up and know which one it is just remembering. It's amazing. Um, sorry. Uh, domestication theories. So I guess we have all these different dogs. So Darwin came up with this thing uh, called evolution. Yay, clap. Um, uh, biological organisms are subject to the pressures in their environments. It's basic or evolution. They must compete with others in order to, does anyone know? Uh, and reproduce. Here we go. Survive, wow, good one. Secure resources and then pass on their DNA by reproducing. So technically that's biologically the point of life is to just get enough resources and to pass on your genetic evidence. And that's what human behavioral ecologists like me as an archeologist do, or at least the theories that I subscribe to. Uh, you can look at people as a zoological animal and this, this critiques to this, but you can look back in the past and you can kind of determine how a lot of site formations happened based on the idea that people were just trying to get the most bang for their buck out of their resources. Um, that's called human behavior ecology. Anyway, generations slowly develop adaptations to help secure their survival and pass on their genes. So the first domestication theory with natural selection is the self-domestication and flight distance hypothesis. So the idea that wolves have more docile genes, or that had them, were less timid of humans. So they sought to exploit human food resources. And this is replaces cooperative hunting. They don't necessarily have to go run as a pack and coordinate, they can just scavenge the leftover ribs outside of our camp. Um, perhaps whole populations did this, perhaps it was just the outcasts of the pack that I talked about, look, I called it back. Um, anyway, perhaps the outcasts, um, as they are predisposed to being more docile. Some call these proto-dogs or early wolf dogs. Um, the more aggressive wolves would have stayed away from humans, or if a wolf came up to a camp and was extremely aggressive, we probably offed it. Um, they continued <laughs> hunting in packs. So, uh, Coppinger, this is Lorna Coppinger and Raymond Coppinger, I think they're zoologists, and they call this flight distance. And this is two books um, I can recommend when I'm done here. Um, and this is the fight or flight instinct of wolves. So how close they're willing to come to humans. And then those who could stand to be around humans longer had a lesser flight distance. They didn't want to run as fast. And those who couldn't stand to be around humans long had a greater flight distance. Scavenging wolves eventually became the proto-dogs that I'm going to talk about. Does that sound familiar? So, um, and then, I was at the point, this is dangerous, but, yeah, and again, it's in their DNA to scavenge, um, and I think labs, I can't remember the disease, but they can literally get a brain disease that's very common in lab, chocolate labs specifically, that they're addicted to food, that's why they do not stop begging, and it, it's interesting, and the domestication, as I'll get into, has a lot of these weird side effects. Um, so natural selection. A theory of this is symbiotic mutualism, and this is selection for decreased aggression. The idea is that humans and wolves are equals in the animal kingdom, so we're both at the top of the food chain. Wolves are both recently efficient pack hunters, just like us, and we hunt the same type of game back in Eurasia, like reindeer, bison, deer, all those different things. We live in complex social groups. We're also monogamous. Uh, we live in the same environments. Um, monogamous, to in the grand scheme of the zoological kingdom, we're monogamous. Uh, wolves and humans would have been complete, competing very closely for the same resources. Wolves may have caught bleeding animals um, and humans were tracking. So it, you didn't just, has anyone hunted? It's the south, I'm sure someone has, there you go. And when you shoot an animal or with an arrow or a bow, it doesn't die instantly. Sometimes you have to chase it and track it, right? So back then, especially with not the stopping pallet of bullets, you had to track like, the blood trail for probably days and hours sometimes. Um, human, and so dogs to sniff the south. Humans might have found a wolf and killed the wolves for the access to the kill. Uh, this close contact would have occurred, and humans would allow the more docile wolves to stay close. They might have been naming these dogs, you know, I close, but like, so that way we know that Rex isn't bad, he's fine, you can throw him a scrap, and it just happens over and over again. Killing the aggressive wolves, or they run away, and these wolves would have learned to scavenge human camps for this notion. There we go. Um, this is out of context. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so Native American tribes used to study wolf behavior. Oh, that's why there was context. Okay. They would study wolf behavior, and we're pretty sure that this is an ethnographic um, scenario, but we're pretty sure that people did this in the prehistoric. Since you're, we're all animists back in the day, everything had a spirit, um, like animals, the trees, the wind. You would have known 
without like an iPhone in your face constantly, you would have known a lot about the animals around you. So they would have known how wolves behave, how they stalk, how they do these things. And Native Americans would take wolf pelts, ride up on, or run up to bison, and bison would react the same way wolves did, and then they'd spring up out of the pelts and stab them, um, or do different, they like basically trick them to think that it was wolves. Um, so we might have done that back in the day. So to just say that we're, we're very close contact animals. Um, or around each other. So artificial selection is humans selecting for certain traits. And this is also called controlled evolution. Darwin was fascinated by this, and um, he loved pigeons and plants. And has anyone read The Origin of Species? Yeah. So like, he noticed, I'll get to that in a second, he noticed that while selecting for certain traits, other undesired traits appeared. So he wanted to breed large, larger beaks, but every time he did that, he would get spotty coats on the pigeons, he would get smaller feet, and he would get fluffier feathers. And if you've read The Origin of Species, it's literally hundreds of pages of him going like, that's interesting. And then at the very end, he's like, oh yeah, this thing called evolution, hey, you man. And then, um, so he was very intrigued by this, and that's kind of what made him fascinated by it, the process of evolution. And um, does anyone know who later figured out what this is? Like Mendel? Yeah, Mendel, um, so with the Punnett squares and how heredity works. Um, so they also kind of lived contemporaneously too, and they never met. Um, I think they were off by like a few years. But domestication theory is artificial selection, or the Pinocchio hypothesis. This is the idea that people adopted wild wolf pups, so went out and grabbed them and brought them in, selecting for certain traits or less aggression, praising those with them, killing those that don't have them. The problem with this, though, is wild wolf pups grow up to be wolves. They're not domestic animals. It's possible to tame wolves. We see that all the time. At um, unfortunately, circuses and zoos, and on TV, like Steve Irwin was with one one time. Um, it's possible to tame them, but it's highly difficult and requires constant training. Whereas a dog, you can kind of, you don't, you should train your dog every day if it's supposed to do service work, but like, they know to sit and like, like a wolf will just not do it. And there's um, a really interesting study where they put a wolf and a dog in two separate crates, and the dog will just give up, try to get out at first, and it just gives up and lays down, and it accepts that I'm stuck in this cage until a human comes. Wolves and coyotes will ruthlessly try to get out of that cage and never stop until they either bite through it or get it out. So there's a very genetic or biological thing in domestic animal brains that just makes them domestic. And wolves are still unpredictable, and they have no domestic biology. So, anyone heard of the Fox experiment? Cool. Yeah. So Dmitry Belyaev was a Soviet geneticist. Some articles say he was exiled to Siberia to do this. I think he just was doing it because he thought it was fun. Um, probably not though, it's Siberia. But was asked to help breed farm silver foxes for the Soviet army. Um, he only bred docile foxes with foxes, and then he bred with more docile foxes, and he bred aggressive ones as a control. What he found though, and this would have made Darwin dance in his grave, was in 20 generations of breeding these foxes, they changed. They got, their tails started to wag, stand upright, their ears kind of flopped down. Uh, these pictures don't have it, but they're ones with floppy ears. Uh, they have, this like the bark, wolf's no bark, you heard a wolf bark? They sometimes do actually, so never mind. But, um, foxes. Foxes, yeah, they don't. But these domestic ones do, and they also have spotted coats, and they can respond to their names. It's really cool. Um, so they can just settle. Uh, and their tails wag, they look, oh yeah, so neotomy, is the fact that domestic animals look more juvenile in adulthood. We look at a puppy and think, like, you get that weird feeling in you that, like, I love that thing, like, immediately. And it's, like, um, <laughs> it's awesome. And it's, it's a response. And humans, or all mammals, at least, it might happen with other species, we, babies look cute and small animals look cute so that we have that feeling to protect them. Mm -hmm. So when we do this and we think that, oh, that wolf puppy looks cute, and you keep breeding the cute ones and the cute ones, it eventually, um, they look more like they're a wolf puppy form than they do an adult. That's called neoteny, and um, it happens in most domestic animals. So if you think of uh, cows, they don't have horns anymore. They have, um, uh, some cows don't, some cows do. Uh, what else is there? Um, why am I drawing a blank? Um, anyone else think of a different? Pigs, they have floppy ears, their tails are different. Um, all different, or rabbits too. They have straight up ears. Pat rabbits have floppy ears, something happens. Um, and remember that puppies have floppy ears too, and they eventually have to stick up. You have a dog with ears that pop up. Um, 
The control group is extremely aggressive, and he called these dragons. And they had extremely high adrenaline levels. Um, and then he figured out that there's some adrenal and aggression DNA coding that has something to do with each other. And um, I don't know if anyone's figured out more about this, but there's uh, NPR Skunk Bear. It's a YouTube channel. They have an episode on, I think, domestication syndrome is what they call it. And he talks about that. Um, it's a great show.